The COVID-19 Immunity Task Force and CanCOVID have partnered on a monthly event series, Research Results and Implications, to offer researchers, policymakers, and Canadians with the latest COVID-19 related results. To learn more about how both organizations have been helping to inform public health policy during the COVID-19 pandemic, please visit our websites at covid19immunitytaskforce.ca and cancovid.ca. Morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Catherine Hankins, one of today's speakers. Bonjour, je suis Catherine Hankins, l'un des orateurs d'aujourd'hui. I've been asked to share some brief instructions for our French attendees so that they can access the live translations, and then I will resume in English. On m'a demandé de partager quelques brèves instructions pour nos participants français afin qu'ils puissent accéder aux traductions en direct. Note à l'attention de nos participants francophones, nous vous invitons à vous rendre au bas de votre écran Zoom où se trouve une icône ressemblant à un globe. Pour indiquer votre langue de préférence, cliquez sur ce globe et sélectionnez « French ». Dès que notre conférencier commence à parler, vous allez entendre notre traducteur. En tout temps, si vous souhaitez revenir à la version anglaise, vous n'avez qu'à cliquer sur le globe et à sélectionner « Off ». De plus, vous verrez qu'une version française de la présentation a été partagée dans le Q&A si vous désirez suivre la présentation en français uniquement. Tous nos présentateurs aujourd'hui présenteront en anglais. So we'll take a moment to allow our French attendees to now turn on their live translation service before I introduce our moderator. I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar, and it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Tali Bogler. Dr. Bogler is a staff physician in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at St. Michael's Hospital, Chair of the Family Medicine Obstetrics Department at St. Michael's, Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto, and co-founder of the Pandemic Pregnancy Guide. We are grateful to her agreeing to lead us in today's event. Dr. Bogler, thanks for being here today with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Hankin, for your kind introduction and for your help in setting up um, our French attendees with a live translation. So welcome everyone to CITF and CanCOVID's third installment in their new seminar series, Research Results and, Implica and Implica Implications. Our topic today is the impact of COVID-19 COVID disease and vaccination on pregnancy and newborns. So before we dive into the presentations, I'd like to add that you don't have to wait until the end of today's event to ask your questions. Simply enter them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and I will ask our speakers as many of the questions as possible during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would now like to bring um, back to the mic our first speaker of the day, and that is actually, again, Dr. Catherine Hankins. So Dr. Hankins is a co-chair of the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force and a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Occupational Health at McGill University. She will be sharing a brief overview of CITF's area of research and various studies. Dr. Hankins, the mic is now back to you. Thank you, Tali. And I'm just going to set the stage so that you can understand the context of today's presentations. Next slide, please. So the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force was established by the government in April 2020. Seems like such a long time ago now. Our mandate is to catalyze, support, fund, and harmonize knowledge on SARS-CoV-2 immunity for decision makers at federal, provincial, and territorial level to inform their efforts to protect Canadians and minimize the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So these are our priority areas of research. We began with the first three at the top there, the seroprevalence studies to assess the extent of SARS-CoV-2 infection across Canada, 
and to understand the nature of the immunity arising from infection. And we developed improved antibody testing methods in our immune testing work. As soon as vaccines started to be approved, we have started up our vaccine surveillance to monitor the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. And now we're well into understanding when and if different populations, depending on their vulnerability, need a third dose of what some people call a booster shot. And we've been looking closely at the safety, the effectiveness, and immunogenicity of vaccines for children under age 21. We take information from all these fields of research to put into our modeling work to model trends in overall immunity across Canada from infection-acquired immunity and from vaccine-induced immunity. Next slide, please. We're supporting 108 studies right across Canada. And this just gives you a little idea of the geographic uh, dispersion of them. Next slide, please. Now, among our studies that we're supporting are four studies that we want to show you today that are focused on uh, pregnancy, newborns, and breastfeeding. Two of the four studies were among the first studies to get support from the task force, recognizing the importance of COVID research in pregnant people, people planning to get pregnant, and those wanting to use human milk to feed the babies. Once vaccines emerged, then we funded two more studies that are being presented today to look at the effects of vaccination on these groups. Next slide, please. So I do want to point out that the results that we're presenting today are preliminary. Most of them have not been peer reviewed, but we feel it is really important that you be made aware of these findings. Our overall mandate is to support studies that inform public policy. And over the past months, results of our studies have been informing public health officials and actually influencing recommendations, guidelines, and policy. So today you're going to hear about knowledge some of which been, has been translated into guidelines and some of which still needs to get into guidelines and into actions on the ground. Next slide, please. So I'll back, turn back over to you, Dr. Bogler, for the moderation. Great, thank you, Dr. Hankins, for providing that overview of CITF and the work your team, your team is doing there. I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. It's Dr. Deborah Money. She's a professor at the University of British Columbia and a clinician scientist at the Women's Health Research Institute. She will be presenting on COVID-19 in pregnancy, epidemiology, maternal and infant outcomes, and COVID-19 vaccines in pregnancy in all of Canada. So Dr. Money, welcome. Sally, thank you so much for that introduction. And, and Kate, thanks for setting the stage for us. So it's my pleasure to um, uh, get this uh, webinar started with um, uh, some of the work that, that I've been privileged to be involved with relating to COVID-19 in pregnancy. Next slide, please. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest relevant to this presentation. So we have had um, uh, very rapidly uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, a group come together to look at the specific outcomes of SARS-CoV-2 infections during pregnancy. We started back in March of 2020 and have had the privilege to be uh, supported by CIHR and uh, public health agency. Um, when the uh, the vaccine hit, again, the questions around what were the issues for vaccines for pregnant uh, women and persons uh, came uh, to fore and we have a national registry. And we've also been involved in doing um, specific um, assessments of seroprevalence in uh, pregnant persons. So I'm gonna share a little bit of this information uh, with you shortly. Next slide. So the... Um, Canadian surveillance of COVID-19 in pregnancy, a call it short term can COVID preg, was set up to basically provide Canadian specific data on outcomes in pregnancy that were um, really set up to support 
care in public policy. Um, so we wanted to know to what degree it was affecting uh, pregnant persons, the maternal outcomes, fetal and infant outcomes, um, and, and this was going to hopefully help um, basically uh, plan and support uh, COVID-19 affected pregnancies. And we also have been very involved in international collaborations, sharing the data uh, with others around the world. Next slide. So uh, this is uh, a, a little bit uh, a, a, um, old, it's from November, um, but this, is, this was our numbers as reported, so somewhat lower than what's actual. Over 9,000 um, uh, individuals have had SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy, um, and we uh, have seen it distributed across the country. Uh, Quebec hasn't been reporting out since December, so their numbers are probably closer to those of Ontario, and Saskatchewan has had challenges with um, a bandwidth to, to do this reporting. Um, so we're well over 10,000, we're sure, uh, of these cases uh, in pregnant individuals, uh, and so terribly important, of course, to understand uh, what, what the outcomes are. Next slide. Um, and this just gives you a visual on what's been happening over time since the beginning that the pandemic was declared, where we naively thought there would be very small, modest numbers of cases in, in pregnant individuals. And of course, uh, this has just gone up and up and up, um, a little bit steeper in some provinces than others, uh, but overall, uh, it's affected uh, people everywhere uh, in this country, as you know. Next slide. So uh, what we've been able to do um, is uh, 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 get data from uh, about a little over four and a half thousand completed pregnancies up to the end of April. We're also pulling data currently through September and I can give you just a preview of that. And what has been terribly important is we've got at least many of the provinces reporting data and we've been able to compare that to data from um, pandemic time period pregnant outcomes for those who don't have SARS-CoV-2 infection and also looking at stats counts. So relevant Canadian comparators. Next slide. And one of the first, um, I guess, maybe not surprising, but somewhat startling um, issues that we noted is that the individuals who are getting SARS-CoV-2 in pregnancy are disproportionately from racialized communities from visible minorities with, um, with the proportion from StatsCan of our population um, on the right of your slide and the proportion that we're seeing in CanCOVID uh, preg, which is showing that uh, significant numbers of South Asian, Black um, and, uh, and Indigenous people are included in the other as well. So, so this, um, this really helps tell us where we should be um, targeting information and, um, uh, and uh, understanding the issues of the uh, burden of disease in these populations. Next slide. So really kind of getting to the, to the nugget of the concerns around uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy. What we have, been, have seen is a startling uh, increase in hospitalizations specific to SARS-CoV-2 related problems, not for other pregnancy reasons. So almost threefold higher rate of hospitalization compared to um, women of this age group in Canada. And then a over sixfold higher rate of ICU admission. Uh, and this in fact, in our September poll is even higher. Uh, so we're closer to 3% ICU um, admission in our most recent analysis. So substantially higher than the very low rate of ICU admission for this young group uh, getting SARS-CoV-2 infection. And to, this is um, data that's uh, still a bit time delayed because of the way the data comes in, but 100% of hospitalized were unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated. So emphasizing the concern around the vulnerability of unvaccinated people. Uh, next slide. Uh, and, and this is a, a trend a graph that just shows that these severity outcomes um, using surrogate markers of oxygen therapy, uh, abnormal x-rays, ICU admission, and so on, um, were very high at the very beginning of the pandemic and then upticked into the Delta um, uh, time period. And we're waiting, of course, to see what's going to happen with Omicron. Next slide. So the other aspect that we're very interested in is pregnancy specific outcomes. So are there more or less 
um, pregnancy complications related to a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And it turns out, um, contrary to some of the international reports, we are not seeing higher rates of um, high blood pressure in pregnancy or cesarean section deliveries. But what we are seeing consistently, and this is in fact also seen in other um, parts of the world, is a substantially higher rate, a twofold higher rate of, of prematurity. And this is not just late prematurity, this goes all the way down to the very vulnerable early extreme preterms. So uh, very worrisome um, because preterm birth is a, is a significant complication for an infant. And, uh, and this is in fact, even in those who were not uh, particularly ill uh, with their infection in pregnancy. We are not seeing to date a uh, increase in stillbirth rates. Uh, next slide. So what we've tried to do a bit different than typical research, we've tried to push this information out as quickly as possible to inform decision-making and, and we're doing it in the form of publicly released reports. And then uh, we've recently submitted for peer reviewed publication, but those take so long that we felt the information needed to be out there once our large group uh, reviewed it and approved it. So this resulted in specific recommendations for vaccine in pregnant persons, pregnancy guidelines, prioritization of pregnant individuals for vaccination, and an understanding that the complications um, were at least as severe as a 55 to 59 year old age group, and uh, perhaps actually even in the last cut a little bit higher than that. So this is, uh, uh, I think, been important um, to have Canadian data to help inform decision making. Next slide. I just want to mention um, this ongoing study. So this is the uh, study where we're looking at uh, the outcomes uh, for those that uh, uh, are choosing or not choosing to be vaccinated in pregnancy. We want to know um, attitudes, we want to know safety and effectiveness, and we have a registry-based approach to that. So individuals can log on to our website um, and uh, give us information on, on how their pregnancy uh, has gone um, and or how things are going during their lactating period, whether they become vaccinated or unvaccinated, but the majority have been vaccinated that have been uh, on this. Next slide. And we have over 5,000 um, uh, so far. We have it in English and French and, uh, and would uh, encourage anyone to, uh, who is interested to uh, provide information to us. Um, but early uh, uh, look at this data shows absolutely no safety concerns or adverse pregnancy outcomes related to vaccination in pregnancy. Next slide. So I really must uh, uh, let you know that, that this has been done with an enormous team across the country who spontaneously came together right away at the beginning of the pandemic to support understanding outcomes for uh, pregnancy uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and thank you very much. I'll uh, pass off the, uh, the mic now, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Money, for sharing your analysis and the pregnancy outcomes in your work. It's quite fascinating, so thank you. Um, I'm going to pivot now and introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Deshane Fell. Um, Dr. Deshane Fell is an associate professor at the University of Ottawa, scientist at Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, and adjunct scientist at ICS. Dr. Fell will be presenting on COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy in Ontario, province-wide evaluation. Dr. Fell, we're all set to hear more about your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bugler, for the introduction and also to the COVID Immunity Task Force for the invitation to present to you today. Next slide, please. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Next slide. So as I'm sure most of you know, um, pregnant people were not included in the initial clinical studies that were performed to test the safety and efficacy of the new COVID-19 vaccines. However, after vaccination programs began around the world last December, and as more and more evidence um, emerged last winter and into the spring showing that pregnant people were at significantly higher risk of severe illness and also poor pregnancy outcomes following COVID infection in pregnancy, as Dr. Money just showed, many countries around the world began to recommend vaccination to this high risk group. And although COVID-19 vaccination was not recommended uh, for pregnancy here in Canada until late April and into May, early May of 2021, it was recommended in the United States and a few other countries earlier during to, uh, 2021. And so real world evidence from studies in these countries is now becoming available at quite a rapid pace. So the slide provides just a very brief summary of some of the key findings that we now know from other studies published to date. 
So first of all, we know that COVID-19 vaccination in, pregnant, in pregnancy produces good immune responses that are similar to those in non-pregnant people. And the types of side effects that are experienced by pregnant people, such as muscle soreness or fatigue, are reported similarly as they are in non-pregnant populations. Importantly, there are a couple of studies now that have shown that COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy is highly effective at preventing COVID-19 infection, similar to the high levels of effectiveness that we're seeing in the general population. And then finally, um, several studies have shown no difference in um, the ability to conceive in vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals, indicating that it is not impacting fertility. So all of this is very reassuring and completely consistent with what we know about um, other vaccinations that are recommended for use in pregnancy, such as, such as influenza and pertussis vaccination. Next slide, please. So turning to pregnancy outcomes, there is now a lot of descriptive data from vaccinated pregnant populations around the world, including large uh, numbers of vaccinated individuals in the United States, England, Scotland, Israel, and Ontario. Um, as Dr. Money uh, just mentioned, these descriptive data have not indicated any increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes following vaccination. Um, and I don't have time to review all of the literature with you today, but importantly, I will draw your attention to a couple of uh, large, very well-conducted population-based case control studies, one from the United States and one from Norway, that assessed COVID-19 vaccination in early pregnancy and did not find any um, association with risk of miscarriage. So again, while all of this taken together is very reassuring, it is obviously critically still important to evaluate other um, pre pregnancy and birth outcomes. So with the support of the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, we're conducting a series of studies here in Ontario, and today I will share a few results from two of our studies. The first of which is to assess uptake and coverage in the pregnant population in Ontario, and the second of which um, looks at several obstetric and newborn outcomes around the time of birth, comparing those outcomes in vaccinated and unvaccinated pregnant individuals. Next slide, please. Um, Ontario has a province-wide birth registry, which is known as Born Ontario, and each year um, information on approximately 140,000 completed births across the province is submitted to the registry, and this includes information on sociodemographic characteristics, medical conditions, um, complications during the pregnancy and around the time of birth, as well as pregnancy and newborn outcomes. In addition, records from prenatal screening, which is conducted at about 12 weeks of pregnancy, is also submitted into the registry in near real time. And we're able to use those records to help us identify the number of currently pregnant people in the province um, over time, over this time period. So on a monthly basis, we extract all records from the Born Information System, the registry, for both the completed as well as the ongoing or continuing pregnancies, and we link them with COVAXON, which is the um, database maintained by the Ontario Ministry of Health for all of the COVID-19 immunizations that are administered in the province. Next slide, please. This slide is looking at uptake of COVID-19 vaccination during the pregnancy, and so you can see that as of the end of September uh, 2021, 59,984 people had received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine during their pregnancy, and 36,055 of those people had received uh, two doses during their pregnancy. The plot on the left um, is showing the calendar timing of when these first and second doses were received. So the first doses are shown in a blue and second doses in light red. And the vertical dotted line indicates April 23rd, 2021, which is when uh, pregnant people were prioritized in the vaccination program in Ontario. So you can see how dramatically the number of um, pregnant individuals initiating COVID-19 uh, vaccination during pregnancy increased uh, after becoming eligible. Next slide, please. This slide shows the rate of coverage during pregnancy. So this is defined as the proportion of pregnant people in each of these calendar months who had received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine either before or during their pregnancy so that they were protected um, during pregnancy. And you can see also the coverage rates have increased um, over time and quite dramatically, particularly in April, May and early June, again, around the time when um, pregnancy was prioritized in the vaccination program. 
the rates have continued to slowly rise over the months, but they seem to have settled out around 60% or so. Um, you can see in September, our estimate was approximately 59% coverage. And if we look at the coverage rate that was reported in the general Ontario population of females um, of reproductive age, the, the rate here was about 20 to 25 percentage points lower than in the general population. So it is certainly lower um, in this group. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to uh, speak briefly about our second objective, which was to evaluate um, several obstetric and newborn outcomes uh, occurring around the time of birth following vaccination and pregnancy. And to do this, we conducted something called a cohort study. Um, and we did this using all births in Ontario between uh, last December when the vaccine program began until the end of September 2021. We compared the outcomes in individuals who'd received at least uh, one dose of COVID-19 vaccine during their pregnancy, so between conception and giving birth, and then we compared them with two groups of people who were not vaccinated during pregnancy. The first group were individuals who were vaccinated after the pregnancy ended, and this was largely because these people gave birth before, um, before they were actually eligible to receive COVID-19 vaccination. And then the second comparison group are those who were not vaccinated at any point, either before, during, or after their pregnancy. Next slide, please. Assessing um, the safety of vaccination during pregnancy requires a careful consideration of the timing of vaccination relative to the relevant point in gestation. And because the study population at this point in time um, largely had received their first dose or had started their vaccination series in the later second trimester and third trimester, as shown in the plot on the bottom left, um, we evaluated peripartum outcomes that occurred around the time of the birth itself. So we evaluated uh, several obstetric outcomes, including postpartum hemorrhage, which is when a person has heavy bleeding after giving, uh, giving birth and can be serious, choriamnionitis, which is an infection of the uterus or membranes, and uh, cesarean delivery, as well as emergent, the need for an emergency cesarean delivery. And then in the newborns, we evaluated um, neonatal intensive care unit admission or NICU admission, and also a low APGAR score at five minutes, um, which may indicate that a baby requires special care, such as assistance with breathing. Next slide, please. So in this study population of completed pregnancies between December and the end of September 2021, you can see that 23% of those in this population had received at least one dose of vaccine during pregnancy. Just over half had received one dose um, during pregnancy and a little less than half had received two doses. And then there were 46% um, of this overall population that had received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine after pregnancy. So this was our first comparison group. And our second comparison group of never vaccinated individuals, um, this was 31% of this overall population. Next slide, please. When we look at the characteristics across these three groups of individuals, there are some similarities, but also uh, quite a few important differences. So I've just highlighted a few here. And for instance, if you look at the proportion of individuals who were under 25 years of age when they gave birth, um, as well as the proportion who smoked in pregnancy or who lived in a lower income neighborhood, you can see the proportions were all higher in the third group at the far right, the never vaccinated at, at any point. Um, and those vaccinated after their pregnancy looked a little bit more similar to those vaccinated during pregnancy. Um, whereas if we look at calendar timing, um, this is also quite different. If you look at the bottom bullet point, only um, a few of the individuals vaccinated during the pregnancy had given birth by the end of April, which is when the vaccine um, was prioritized for pregnancy in the province. Whereas almost more than two thirds actually gave birth before the end of April in the middle group, which is those individuals who started their vaccination series after pregnancy and about half, of, uh, half in the third comparison group. Next slide, please. It's very important, um, just going back to my last slide for a, minute, for a moment, it's very important when you do these kinds of studies to, um, to be able to take those factors into consideration when actually comparing outcomes in, um, in the different groups. So if we move to the next slide, I'll describe what I mean. 
Um, so here on the left in the table, um, we've presented the rates of the study outcomes that we evaluated in the vaccinated group. That's the, the first column of numbers that you see. And then the second column of numbers that you see are the rates in um, the, the non-vaccinated group. But th these are the individuals who got vaccinated after pregnancy. So they were not vaccinated during pregnancy. And what you can see is that the rates were actually very, very similar in these two groups, um, and none were higher in the vaccinated group. And then in the plot on the right, these are the results from our more formal statistical analyses where you take into consideration all of those other differences I was discussing on the last slide. Um, and, uh, and then you're able to make a more valid comparison of these rates between the two groups. So in this plot, the vertical line, um, which is labeled one, this means this indicates no difference between the groups and any estimates that would be to the right of that line would indicate an increased risk following vaccination. So what you can see here clearly in this plot is that after we um, account for the, the many differences between the two groups, you can see there was no indication of any higher risk for any of these outcomes um, between our study groups. And the same was true also with the other comparison group, which in the interest of time, I haven't, uh, I haven't shown the slide. Next slide, please. We also did several subgroup analyses to see whether there were any differences um, according to whether or not an individual had received the Pfizer vaccine or had received Moderna vaccine, because most of the population who was vaccinated had received an mRNA vaccine. We also looked at whether they'd received one or two doses during pregnancy and also the gestational timing, and none of these, um, none of these factors made any difference in our results. There was no indication of any increased risk um, according to any of these subgroup analyses. And next slide, please. So in conclusion, in this large study with over 22,000 individuals who had received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine during pregnancy, uh, vaccination was not associated with any of these peripartum outcomes that we evaluated. Um, these results were very consistent, as I mentioned, in subgroup analyses that we looked at, and also regardless of which comparison group that, that we um, compared with. So while this information is reassuring and adds to the growing evidence supporting safety of vaccination during pregnancy, obviously evaluation of other important pregnancy and newborn outcomes remains uh, needed. We've uh, recently updated our data and we are working on a study now looking at additional outcomes and I expect that we'll see several other um, studies from uh, internationally from other countries early in the new year on this topic. So with that, uh, next slide please. I'd just like to thank you for your attention and uh, really thank my study investigators, as well as the Ontario Ministry of Health for providing access to the database, the Ontario hospitals for providing um, the, the uh, data on births in the province to the birth registry, and also to Born Ontario. And finally, to the COVID Immunity Task Force for their funding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fell, for sharing your work with us today, including the emerging evidence and COVID-19 vaccine uptake in pregnancy. This is very important, especially as we head into, um, you know, advocating for boosters in this population. So this is very, very interesting. Um, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Deborah O'Connor. Dr. O'Connor is the Earl W. McHenry Professor and Chair in the Department of Nutritional Sciences in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. O'Connor will be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 disease and vaccination on human milk antibodies. Dr. O'Connor, I will pass the virtual mic over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bogler and the organizers for uh, giving our team an opportunity to pre present a snippet of our work. Next slide. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Next slide. So mother's own milk is the optimal way to feed infants. In addition to serving as an excellent source of nutrition, maternal milk contains a rich bioactive uh, components that promote immune development and provides protection against childhood infections. A focus of our research over the past 20 plus years has been an, on evaluating strategies to promote human milk use, which has included the use of pasteurized donor human milk when mother's own milk is unavailable for hospitalized infants. Appreciation of the benefits of human milk has spurred a dramatic increase in the use of donor milk among milk banks that are accredited through the Human Milk Banking Association of North America. Primary recipients are very low birth weight infants while they're at risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, a severe bowel emergency in the neonatal intensive care unit. Next slide. 
While there has been a dramatic increase in the use of donor human milk, in fact, use of donor milk and donor human milk banks have existed in North America for over 100 years. However, in the early 1980s, over the perceived risk that HIV could be transmitted to an infant through donated human milk, all but one of 23 milk banks in Canada closed. While it is indeed true, some pathogens such as HIV under certain conditions can be transmitted through human milk, to ensure a safe uh, supply, potential donors are carefully screened and, match, um, and milk is pasteurized, which kills the HIV virus. Very early in the COVID pandemic, the unknowns about whether or not SARS-CoV-2 could be transmitted through human milk began to once again destabilize milk banks globally. Early research and public health guidance in Canada significantly mitigated this risk. Next slide. Early in the pandemic, we reached out to our colleagues in the Containment 3 facility at the University of Toronto to ensure a pasteur, our pasteurized, um, pasteurizers, pasteurization procedures at the Roger Hicks and Ontario Human Milk Bank, one of the Himbana accredited milk banks, were sufficient to destroy the SARS-CoV-2 virus in human milk should it get there. This table uh, demonstrated in 10 milk samples spiked with SARS-CoV-2 and subsequently pasteurized using the holder method, which is 62.5 degrees C for 30 minutes, reduced the cytopathic effects of SARS-CoV-2 below detectable levels. Interestingly, even in milk samples that were held at room temperature for 30 minutes and not pasteurized, had some reduction in cytopathic activity as illustrated in the left hand of the slide, where a one times 10 to the power of seven tissue infectivity dose was added per mill of milk. Next slide. So um, we, we then went on to address a series of other questions in support of milk banking and the use of human milk generally. First, could COVID-19 disease be transmitted into human milk? Next slide. To do this work, um, we collected milk at four week intervals over three months from two cohorts of women during the first three waves of the pandemic. The first cohort included lactating women who had tested positive for COVID-19 by PCR or prior to routine availability of the test were determined to be presumptively positive. 10 of these women were actively infectious at the time of first milk collection. The second cohort included women donating milk to the Roger Hicks and Ontario Milk Bank. All milk was analyzed for SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid using real-time PCR at Mount Sinai Hospital and all samples were found to be negative. Next slide. The next question we had was whether we could find antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in human milk in these two cohorts of women, and if present, were they neutralizing to the virus? Next slide. For much of this work, we focused on IgA. IgA is the predominant immunoglobin found in human milk, most as secretory IgA, which is resistant to digestion and plays a prominent role in neonatal mucosal immunity. IgA was assessed using a commercial assay designed for serum, but validated for human milk using pre-pandemic milk samples we had in our biobank. The neutralization capacity was assessed using live virus microneutralization assay, again, in the containment three facility at the University of Toronto. Next slide. Results of the milk IgA over time from women who were COVID-19 positive are summarized here. The different color dots represent the different time points that milk was collected. The dashed lines represent different cutoffs indicating the milk was positive for IgA with the black line representing two standard deviations above the mean of our 100 pre-pandemic samples. The yellow line representing a borderline result suggested by the kit and the red line, dashed line, a truly positive, again, suggested by the kit for serum. The Vs on some of these dots represent milk samples collected after vaccination. So excluding samples collected af after vaccination, a little more than 50% of the women 
had at least one milk sample that tested positive for anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA. And the other uh, point from this slide is you can see here, samples positive for anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA diminished over time. So very few positives after six months um, post symptoms of um, the disease. Next slide. This slide summarizes the neutralization findings for milk samples of women diagnosed with COVID-19. The setup of this slide is similar to the previous with cutoff values for neutralization reported in the literature. So what we found was half of participants had at least one milk sample that was neutralizing to the virus. 39% of samples that tested positive for IgA were neutralizing. And interestingly, 25% of samples that were negative for IgA were neutralizing, reminding us again of the many bioactive components in human milk that can play a role in neutralizing viruses. Next slide. So this slide summarizes the IgA levels found in human milk from donors to the Ontario Human Milk Bank. So what we found was approximately 5% of the donors had at least one sample positive for anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, IgA. And this is compared to approximately a 3% positivity rate in milk samples collected prior to the pandemic. Of samples that contained anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA, approximately one third were neutralizing. Next slide. So we've been working most recently on what impact does the maternal vaccination have on antibodies uh, to SARS-CoV-2 in human milk? And if present, are these antibodies neutralizing? And does it matter what vaccine type or time between dose does this matter? Next slide. So we've been looking at a third cohort of women who were recruited through social media or word of mouth for this work. Milk samples were collected pre the first vaccination and weekly thereafter until four weeks post second dose. The time between intervals or between doses varied as did the availability of vaccine in Ontario. So 78 women provided this series of milk samples most received either two doses of Pfizer or Moderna, and I'll present results from these two here today. Next slide. So this slide summarizes the presence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA in milk by whether or not women received either Moderna, which is in the dark line, or Pfizer, which is in the light gray line. There was a statistical interaction between the time point milk was collected and vaccine type but for the purpose of simplicity, I'll just summarize the main effects here today. As noted, you will see a rise in the anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA in milk about two weeks after the first dose of either vaccine that diminishes back to baseline by the time the second dose is administered. After a second dose, a second peak is observed. And generally, the peaks in this sample for Moderna were greater than that for Pfizer. Next slide. In this slide, the data are separated now by vaccine interval with the shorter interval dose defined as three to six weeks, and that's in the dark line, and the longer dose of vaccine interval defined as six to less than 16 weeks in the light line. So you will note the shorter the interval between the doses resulted in a significantly higher IgA levels at week one, two, and three after the second dose than the longer uh, vaccine interval between doses. And as we can see from both this graph and the one previous, IgA decreases quite quickly after the second dose. Next slide. So in this uh, third cohort, we did look at IgA. And to do this because of the, as I showed you previously, IgA up makes up a smaller proportion of the total immunoglobins. We had to do some additional validation to do this work. And what um, we saw was uh, following the second dose is um, this is where you saw your important increase to IgA to uh, uh, being a positive result. And like I, unlike IgA, it seems to be more stable after the second dose, although our samples only go to week four after the second dose. So next slide. 
So in conclusion, it appears and our data is consistent with others reported in the literature that SARS-CoV-2 is unlikely to be transmitted into human mouth. Antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 are frequently found in milk of women following COVID-19. Uh, antibodies in, are infrequently observed six months after sy symptom onset. And while the presence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 um, immunoglobin A appears to be associated with the capacity to neutralize the virus, milk samples without antibodies can also be neutralizing. And the presence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgA in milk we saw was associated with the type of mRNA vaccine administered and the interval between doses. And we're currently working on the neutralization capacity of this, these samples presently. Next slide. So I'd just like to thank this very multidisciplinary team where a lot of people came together very quickly, very early in the pandemic to sort out uh, what we needed to do at the, the Milk Bank. And um, particularly like to thank Samantha Ishmaels, who's a graduate student who did a lot of the antibody work for this project. And last slide. And just to like to thank uh, the funders of this work, CIHR and the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hankins, for covering those key findings with us. So I'm sure some of our attendees have questions they'd like to ask. And uh, before we jump into the Q&A part of today's event, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sharon Unger from the University of Toronto, Sina Health, and the Roger Hicks in Ontario Human Milk Bank, as she will be joining us for this portion of today's event to help answer some of the questions. So thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Unger. Um, and now to the members of the audience, if you haven't already done so, please feel free to enter some of your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible in the time remaining. Um, and so I'm going to start off with our, our first question here um, that we received, and um, it's about boosters. And I, I know this is on the mind of so many people right now um, as we you know, have boosters and, and it's becoming eligible you know, for 18, uh, 18 and over in many, in many areas um, in Canada. And I was just wondering, this question came up, is there any guidance regarding how far into term a booster is recommended? Um, and should pregnant individuals be prioritized for the booster vaccine? Um, maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Money to start and Dr. Deshane Fell if you could um, collaborate on this as well. Tali, did you want me just to do a quick refresh on what we've found so far of the presentations and then move to the questions yeah, or should sure, we move right into the questions? Um, up, up to you can, why don't you do that? We can do a quick refresh and then we could we can move into the questions. Sure. Okay. So could we screen share again, please, for the uh, summary? I just want to say that there have been some really good questions coming in and I'm just doing a recap in case you came late or you just want to have somebody just draw out the key findings so that we can move to the questions. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. So as we've heard, COVID-19 is serious among pregnant people. We have seen increasing steadily numbers of pregnant people in Canada with COVID-19 since April 2020. 100% of pregnant people that have been hospitalized with COVID are either unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated. They suffer more severe disease than do non-pregnant women of the same age, meaning between 20 and 49. They're three times more likely to be hospitalized and six to seven times more likely to be admitted to intensive care. And actually, as was pointed out, their complications profile is more like people aged 55 to 59. Next, please. What about the baby? What about the baby? So pregnant people with COVID are twice as likely to have a premature birth. And when you look at extremely premature birth, meaning 20 to 27 weeks gestation, they are four times more likely to have an extremely premature birth, which we know is really difficult for survival of the infant. Next, please. Vaccines are effective in pregnant people. They induce really good immune responses and there's no increase in the risk of any adverse outcomes. 
And that is for whether you got the Pfizer-BioNTech versus Moderna for your first dose, whether you got one or two doses during pregnancy, <clears throat> and when in pregnancy the vaccine was given, which trimester. Next, please. They are safe in pregnant people. And this is important because obviously when you're pregnant, you're really concerned about safety for yourself and safety for your baby. So there's no association between COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy and adverse birth outcomes. There's no increased side effect risk by trimester after your first or second dose. There are similar side effects that non-pregnant people get like the sore arm and the temporary muscle soreness. And there's no evidence that vaccination affects fertility. Vaccinated people have the same incidence of pregnancy compared to unvaccinated people. Next, please. Human milk appears to be safe for infants. And I think after that last presentation, a lot of us want to know, uh, actually, is it beneficial if you've been vaccinated or you've had COVID? Can you transmit antibodies that might help your baby? So the virus is unlikely to get from the mother into human milk. The antibodies that we have seen are frequently found in the milk of women who've had COVID-19, although they do disappear after about six months. And if IgA, the immunoglobulin IgA, appears to be associated with the capacity to neutralize the virus. And as, as was pointed out, some milk samples without antibodies can also be neutralizing, speaking again, to the importance of breast milk, of human milk for babies. The vaccine-induced antibodies are secreted into human milk. And I think we'll be asking to know, is that helpful to the baby? Can it help the baby? <laughs> Next slide, please. So what are the policy implications moving forward? I think we're, we're thinking about them right across the country right now. We need to prioritize those third doses in pregnant people in the face of Delta and Omicron. We need to reinforce vaccine confidence among pregnant people, among primary caregivers and among birthing uh, professionals. We need to tailor our vaccine confidence campaigns to reach out to those people who have been least likely to be vaccinated. And currently those are pregnant people under 25 from lower income areas in rural regions and who smoke. We need to make sure we reach out to those who have young children who are not yet eligible for vaccination because those kids may bring SARS-CoV-2 infection to them. And to those who are participating in congregate settings with unvaccinated children. So they've got kids in maybe in daycare and in school. Next, please. We need to strengthen the vaccine confidence in individuals who wish to become pregnant. So anybody planning to get pregnant we need to amplify our evidence-informed messaging. And I'm hoping that everybody on this webinar will be one of the relayers of the evidence that we need to share with others. Refute erroneous disinformation that links infertility to COVID-19 vaccines and use social media platforms for effective messaging. We also need to conduct campaigns to reinforce the safety of human milk as evidence indicates that human milk remains a safe and healthy choice for infants. Next, please. I just wanna say that you'll find a summary uh, of this seminar at covid19immunitytaskforce.ca following the webinar. But I wanna turn back over to Tally now because there are lots of great questions coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hankins. And sorry that I went straight to the questions. I got excited about some of the questions that were coming in and I just want to answer them already and go through as many as possible. That's okay. No, that refresher and just overview, I think sets the stage one more time so that we can answer these questions that are coming in. Um, okay, so let's let's get to it and, and we'll go back to boosters. And that was the question that was coming in and a couple more are coming in about boosters because it's a very important topic. Um, so Dr. Money and Dr. Deshane Fell, can you can you talk about boosters? And I think I just want to phrase it like, you know, before we start, in Canada right now, at least in Ontario, we're not yet prioritizing the pregnant population specifically for boosters. And given uh, Dr. Fell, what you presented in terms of uptake, you know, what are you what are you predicting now in terms of uptake from what we've seen so far um, over the last, you know, since January? What are you predicting in terms of uptake 
for the third booster, given that there was a discrepancy compared to the general population? And how do we, you know, what do we do about that? And how do we, you know, come together to, uh, you know, have a message that's strong and, and reassure people about a booster in pregnancy? Sure, I can get started and maybe Dr. Money wants to jump in as well. So as you mentioned, um, I don't think the booster dose is recommended quite yet, but my guess is that it will come soon. I, I know in the United States and the United Kingdom, they're now recommending the booster dose uh, for pregnant individuals. Um, I can't really predict what we will see in, in terms of um, uptake in the pregnant population. I do think what we'll see is, um, you know, probably some of the people who are newly pregnant now who, who received their first and second dose before their pregnancy, perhaps a number of months ago now, I think we'll probably see, you know, some of those people getting their booster doses in pregnancy. I'm not sure there'll be too, too many who end up getting actually three doses while pregnant, just because pregnancy is obviously a time limited state. So my guess is that number will be fairly small, but we might see some perhaps getting the second and third dose. There's a lot of, um, you know, depending on kind of when when a person was pregnant relative to their recommendations and eligibility and so on really impacts kind of when they're getting vaccinated. So um, I think we'll find out in the in the coming months and, and we'll see what the recommendations um, say as well. Thanks. Um, Tally, maybe I'll just jump in here as well. Thanks to Shane. Um, in terms of the boosters, we are just um, in our very preliminary look at our covered registry are seeing some uh, pregnant individuals taking the opportunity to get the booster dose. Um, what we're saying officially at the moment is if you are a candidate, if you're able to access the booster dose and you're pregnant or, or breastfeeding, please access it. Um, but uh, we, are, we are just doing the final uh, look at our more recent data, uh, which as I suggested, uh, and this is pre-Omicron data, um, is that certainly um, hospitalizations and ICU admissions, if anything, have gone up a little bit in the later part of the Delta wave. And so we are talking with our public health leaders and going to be advocating for prioritization of pregnant individuals for booster shots, but we're not quite there yet. It's all been a bit of a scramble, to be honest, um, as booster shots have become clearly very important in this uh, time period. I do know they're recommended in Quebec. They are recommended in Quebec. If you're eligible for a booster dose and you're pregnant, you should get it. And in Ontario, it's everyone over the age of 18 and yeah. up. So, you know. But it's more a matter of, of accessibility, right? Exactly. So, yes, everybody over 18 is recommended to get a booster when their time comes. But um, should we be um, moving pregnant people up the queue because access is an issue, certainly in some provinces, uh, as, as uh, the public health uh, delivery of vaccines is, is ramping up yet again. The follow up to that question, was there any guidance regarding how far into term a booster is recommended? I think that's sort of speaking about which trimester is the safest. Um, is, it, is there any point in the pregnancy that it potentially might be too late to get a vaccine or not as recommended? Any thoughts about that? I know, you know. Well, well I'll, I'll start and I'm sure Deshane will jump in. Um, uh, when you have access to the booster, please take the booster regardless of where you're at. Uh, we know for sure that it is uh, it being optimally uh, protected is the best thing to prevent infection and severe disease. Uh, might even become more of an issue in Omicron as we see this roll out. Um, and certainly uh, we know generally speaking, and, and Deborah can speak to this a little bit more, is that women mount a very good antibody response and those antibodies pass through to their baby. So the best way to deliver protective antibodies to the baby is to have robust antibody levels in the mom. Yeah, just a follow-up question to that. The answer is get the vaccine whenever you're eligible and can get it. But is, is there a time that it's more beneficial in, in terms of transfer of antibodies to help protect the infant in the first few months of life? Is there an ideal time or ideal trimester? I can start and then perhaps the other um, panelists might have some additional comments. I mean, I think what we know, particularly from uh, pertussis vaccination in pregnancy, which is another vaccine that we routinely recommend during pregnancy, that one, that uh, vaccine program is really um, all about 
transferring antibodies to the babies to prevent infection in the babies, as opposed to protecting the mother. So it's quite different from the COVID vaccination program, of course. But in that program, um, the recommendations are that um, uh, people should receive their vaccine, I think, between 27 and 32 weeks of gestation to optimize the transfer of maternal antibodies across the placenta um, to the baby so that they're protected in their early months of life. Yeah. Okay, great. The other question that's come up is about breakthrough infections after, you know, the term is fully vaccinated. And now, you know, the term fully vaccinated, I would probably just say double vaccinated for now, because I don't know what the term fully vaccinated really means in the, in the era now with a third dose. Um, what are we seeing in terms of breakthrough infections in terms of severity? So someone has two vaccines, gets COVID, um, are, are we seeing more severe illness in the pregnant population or still more mild? illness with a breakthrough infection? Um, maybe I can try this one. Um, so we looked again at our more recent data, re remembering that what we're pulling is, is Delta wave time period, not Omicron time period. Um, and we saw very low rates of breakthrough infection in what we were then calling fully the double vaccinated. So 3.7% of uh, uh, pregnant uh, persons had a breakthrough infection and uh, uh, no cases of hospitalization or ICU admission in fully vaccinated, meaning to then. Now, obviously, we're going to need to follow very closely in this new time period, um, but I, I think the general message is not going to change. Uh, being even partially vaccinated is, is helpful. Being fully, which now is going to be three probably, uh, is better, and, and it's definitely going to uh, reduce uh, risk of infection, uh, uh, so, uh, risk of infection and risk of severe disease. Okay. Thank you. The follow-up to that in terms of breakthrough infections, um, you know, let's say now in Omicron, after two vaccines, perhaps more people will get infected. And let's say it's more mild disease. Mild disease in pregnancy, should we still be concerned about what that might do to the pregnancy itself, as you said, in terms of preterm births and the infant as well? Um, and so, yeah, I think it's an important question because even if we see mild disease, does that have any implications that are different in someone who's pregnant? I'm sorry, I feel like I keep answering the questions here. I want my colleagues to order of to questions. We're going to get to the breast milk um, oh, stuff as well, which is fascinating <laughs> and very interesting and helpful as well right now. But yes, Dr. Money, if you could help answer that question. Um, so what is uh, troubling uh, in our data so far is that even uh, individuals who get mild infection uh, still have that risk of preterm birth. And we uh, speculate with some basic science data to back it up that in fact, the inflammatory response um, that the mom has to uh, mount in order to combat the virus, even if they themselves don't get terribly ill is likely causing some abnormalities in placental function. And that may be the mechanism or part of the reason why we're seeing increased rates of prematurity and other um, uh, complications such as ICU or NICU admission. So, uh, that's a rather long-winded way of saying we would really prefer pregnant individuals don't get uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection at all. It's ideal, it's better if they don't get terribly ill, but we really um, do want to prevent infection because of potential adverse outcomes for the baby. And I think that's a really important message, and it's a little bit more nuanced and a bit different than the general population, because a lot of people are saying, well, you know, if I get infected, as long as I've had two doses, I'll have less severe of disease potentially. But this is different in the pre pregnant population, especially that signal that you're seeing in terms of preterm birth and maybe some placental changes as well. I think that's really important as we talk about boosters in the, over the next few weeks. Um, the second, uh, you know what, I'm gonna switch to the next question and that's more about infants. And this question is about the mortality risk of severe disease in infants I think born to a mother with COVID-19 infection or born to a mother who was vaccinated in the pregnant individual. I think Dr. Deshane Fell, you understood this question and maybe um, you, can, you can answer it better than I can ask the question. Sure, I, if I understood the question correctly, I think it was just asking about um, infant outcomes, including mortality um, in babies who were born to mothers who'd had COVID infection in pregnancy and also to mothers who'd been uh, vaccinated during pregnancy. So, I mean, I think we heard 
um, very good evidence from Dr. Money earlier about what the Canadian data show in terms of um, increased risks for adverse pregnancy outcomes following infection in pregnancy and especially following severe um, illness, meaning requiring admission to hospital or ICU in the pregnant women. Um, and we know that the rates of preterm birth are much higher. And obviously being born preterm, as someone just alluded to, I think a few minutes ago, being born preterm in and of itself is uh, one of the biggest determinants or uh, risk factors leading to um, early infant death. And so obviously we would be very concerned about uh, increased rates of preterm birth. On the vaccination side of things, um, you know, what we've seen so far in the data from around the world that is currently available looking at pregnancy outcomes uh, following vaccination in pregnancy, as I alluded to in my presentation, we're not seeing any indication of any increased risk in preterm birth, for example. So we're seeing a much higher risk with infection. We're not seeing uh, from the available data any increased risk following vaccination in pregnancy. Great. Dr. Money, anything you wanted to add to that in terms of the infant side of things? No, I think Deshane covered it really well there. Right. I, I think that really is, is the nugget of it. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to turn over to breastfeeding a little bit. And I think this is really a fascinating area as well. And I can tell you, I'm getting a lot of questions about this, especially um, since we don't have a vaccine yet for kids under five. And for parents or mothers who are, vac who are breastfeeding, the potential of, you know, transferring antibodies is very, it's, very, it's reassuring to them. It's hopeful. And they want to know how much you know, how much antibodies are actually being transferred, um, how well, how much they should be breastfeeding. This is a very common question right now. Um, and one question that's come in, you know, does the baby get similar immunization benefits as the adult who's getting vaccinated? You want me to start? Sure. <laughs> so I, I think that those are great questions and we don't have a, a very precise answer. Uh, clearly, the baby is receiving protection from the very targeted, very specific antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, but also all of the broad spectrum of immune factors in human milk do protect the baby from infection. Um, so we don't know we don't know precisely rates, uh, but we we do know that it is protective. Uh, so I know that there are questions out there about should I start providing human milk to children up to age five, up to the vaccination age. And while I can certainly understand the motivation and it, it makes, uh, I can understand that that makes some sense. I think that we just don't have the scientific evidence to support it, even if I, I completely understand the question. Okay. The specific question as well is, will the baby get similar immunization benefits as the adult? Again, I don't think that we have that degree of precision. Mm -hmm. We know that there is an immune benefit, but we don't know precisely. And, it, and certainly the studies are going on right now about directly vaccinating children. And NAXI will come out with uh, advice as soon as that those studies are available. And uh, you know, I honestly believe that it is gonna be a combination of provision of human milk and directly providing vaccines. We need to wait until the advice is ready. Great, thanks Sharon. The next question is about boosters. And I think we've addressed this, but is there any preliminary evidence on the benefits of a third booster specifically in pregnant women as compared to two vaccines? I think Dr. Money, you've, you've Answer yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think we we have absolutely no reason to assume pregnant women will uh, behave differently in terms of their antibody response to the booster. So when they have that booster, they will they will make good antibodies and they will have that additional benefit that we're seeing appears to be critical for Omicron protection. Uh, I, I don't think there'll be a, a difference, particularly in that antibody response and protection from infection uh, compared to other adults. May I just add on from the perspective of breastfeeding as well, when we saw that women were vaccinated very early in the pregnancy and then continued through and we collected milk samples after the baby was delivered, there was really a, a, a significant decline in antibodies and really we didn't find antibodies six months after the vaccination. So I think from the perspective of 
transmitting antibodies through human milk, those boosters are also very important. Yeah, that's a great point. And if I can just, sorry to jump in and add to that, we, we do know that antibodies cross the placenta well. So if you have a good response, and if you're post six months from your series, your response is known to be waning, if you get boosted, you will make a better response as a pregnant individual, and you will pass that to baby. It doesn't preclude all of the advantage of, of breastfeeding and feeding of human breast milk, but but the that great transfer across the placenta is a hugely valuable um, opportunity to uh, both protect the mom, which we desperately want to do, and to deliver antibodies to uh, to the baby. And maybe I can just add one follow-up comment to that, which is, although we don't have direct studies just yet showing us how um, effective vaccination in pregnancy might be against preventing infection in the neonates or the newborns, we know, you know, we have a lot of experience with um, influenza immunization in pregnancy and pertussis immunization in pregnancy, and we know that it provides very good protection. Mm -hmm. The maternal antibodies provide good protection to the babies in the first um, four to six months of life, which is often a time period, at least in the case of influenza, right. where they're not eligible to receive um, the vaccine themselves. Right. And I'll just follow up with, I always have this little quote on my desk. Systematic reviews suggest that breastfeeding protects against respiratory infection. So this is pre-pandemic data with levels of protection globally, 30% for morbidity, 50% for hospital admission, and 60% for mortality. So even pre-COVID-19, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, importance to breastfeeding at this time. Great. Um, thanks everyone for your input on that. Um, the next question is, hello, great studies and presentations. Thank you. I noticed that vaccination in second and first trimesters were examined together as a group for impacts on outcomes. Do results differ by first versus second trimester timing of vaccination? Wondering what are the impacts of COVID vaccine in first trimester alone on outcomes, including neonatal outcomes and preterm birth? Sure, I can take that question. Thank you. It's a very important question. Um, I don't know if you recall the slide that I showed a plot of the distribution of the gestational age or the timing in pregnancy when vaccinated people that we're able to look at right now had received their COVID-19 vaccination. So just simply because of the fact that um, you know, most people got vaccinated last spring. Anyone who was in the first trimester then is probably still pregnant now or just giving birth now or early into 2022. And that's not just the case in Ontario, it's happening all over the world as well. And so initially, as the babies are born, you can look at the mid to later um, gestational timing of vaccination first because those babies are born first and you have to kind of wait for the babies whose uh, uh, mothers were vaccinated early in the pregnancy. So in the slide, I did show first and second trimester combined. That was only because there were so few first trimester vaccinations in the current study population. But we will be looking at earlier pregnancy um, timing of vaccination in the new year with updated data. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Fell. Next question. I'm a lactating mother. I gave birth before the vaccine was recommended during pregnancy in early February. I have since received two doses of Moderna, both receiving... Post receiving both doses of the vaccine, I gave my five-year-old breast milk multiple times a day in hopes of passing along some immunity to him. Are you, aware, are you aware of any studies or are there any studies currently underway that would support this practice? And this is sort of what I was alluding to before. It's a great question and you're not alone whoever asked this question. I've received many of similar questions to this. Yes, I'm, I'm not aware of any studies, as I also said, I understand it, but I'm not aware of the literature. Dr. O'Connor? Yeah, so, you know, there's um, a whole old body of literature uh, out there trying to use cow's milk, like um, using cow's milk, calling immune milk to concentrate the immunity in cow's milk as a way, as a way um, to provide immunity of, uh, of like rotavirus and a whole bunch of other um, viruses. So it, the, the theory is out there, but um, there's no study that I know uh, uh, with COVID-19 that has looked at that specifically. Perhaps your expertise even just answering, do antibody transferring infants differ from older children through breast milk? 
you know, I don't, I don't believe yeah. that there's a difference. The primary antibody in human milk is secretory IgA, which is mm -hmm. interesting. It's different than the antibody that's transmitted via the placenta, which is an IgG antibody. So secretory yeah. IgA is quite interesting because it coats the baby's, all of the baby's mucosa. And as the baby ingests it, it's not destroyed by the gastric acidity. Right. So, you know, when you typically see a breastfeeding baby, they often have milk absolutely everywhere coming out their nose and, and everything. And, and I think, you know, the secretory IgA is just um, coating everything and is, is really a robust antibody. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I presume that it's the same right. in older children. I'm not sure that it would behave any differently. Interesting, there's a real new study out that even looked at antibodies to IgG, which you would see that tick up after vaccination. Um, normally you wouldn't think, um, you know, I agree with Dr. Unger 100%, IgA tends to be the one that's thought to be most resistant to digestion, but they're still seeing IgG antibodies in the stools of babies. So that I think that's kind of interesting too. And I think I saw in the chat um, they are able to correlate that somewhat to the amount of antibodies that were in the milk. So very, I mean, this field with breastfeeding, there's like, um, there's yeah. a few studies, but they're small and so on. But that's what the one recent study reported. Really fascinating. Um, next question is next steps. What neonatal outcomes and developmental indicators will be examined? How long will children be followed for? And what do you think explains the preterm births observed? So a little bit different. I think there's two parts to that question, but let's start with um, the neonatal outcomes and developmental indicators. Sure, I can start with that. So um, obviously this was the first study that we've done. And as I mentioned, we're just starting to look at other outcomes now. So um, looking at preterm birth and stillbirth um, as well as other outcomes in the, in the mothers. Um, in terms of looking beyond the early neonatal period, there, uh, there will be a study done here in Ontario through ICES to follow the babies over time. Um, I can tell you that I've been doing a lot of work in the past five years looking at longer term follow up of children um, whose mothers had received the H1N1 pandemic um, influenza vaccine and also um, seasonal influenza vaccine and pertussis vaccine in pregnancy. So we've done a number of studies where we looked at children uh, during the first year and then also up to the age of five, looking at various different um, health outcomes and, and didn't find any, um, any indication of, of any increased risk for those outcomes in, um, in the children. So I think we'll be doing parallel work. Obviously, in this case, we do need to wait for the babies to be born and to get older before we can really do those studies. But I think we'll start to see maybe some early studies, perhaps with six months of follow-up, I hope, um, maybe out of places like Israel, for example, where they vaccinated their population much earlier than we did and included pregnant people almost from the very beginning. So, and they have very good data. So I'm, I'm hoping we'll start to see some early studies fairly soon. Great, thank you. Dr. Mani, I think you answered about the preterm births, but anything else you wanted to add to that? Well, I just wasn't sure if the question was really about uh, the disease or about the vaccine, but but certainly in terms of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy, um, the the Can COVID Preg group are following uh, early neonatal outcomes, and then we have a subgroup um, that are trying to get one-year outcomes. It's a little more challenging, obviously, to do that, um, but we are very interested to understand what the longer-term impact is of being an infant of a mom who had the infection, um, and. I am worried that there may be some potential adverse outcomes associated with that, even just associated with the prematurity alone. Um, uh, so that's sort of, so there's sort of two parallel uh, sets of work that needs to happen, both studying the infection and studying the, the uh, presumed beneficial impact of, of vaccine. Thank you. There are two questions that came in French, um, and this is about breastfeeding again. Um, and the question is, should breastfeeding mothers be recommended to be prioritized for a third dose, seeing as they can transmit antibodies to their babies? So we'll start with that. And then the second question, and you could answer it as well, is just, is there a more significant transfer in antibodies via placenta or via breast milk? Those are tough questions. I was waiting to see if Dr. O'Connor was going to step in. You know, I'm biased in thinking that, uh, 
pregnant and lactating women should be prioritized. But the reality is, is that all Canadians need to now be prioritized for a booster dose. Our entire population needs it as soon as possible. Would you add? Dr. O'Connor. Um, yeah, no, I, I, these are hard questions. I, I don't know. Uh, I agree with Dr. Unger's answer. I, I can't exactly remember the one, the one question you asked. Um, it was, should, should um, lactating individuals be prioritized for a third dose given that antibodies transfer? There are places in the world that have done that. Mm -hmm. um, any recommendations yeah. for Canada? <laughs> you know, for whoever is listening to this and, you know, in terms of actual implementation of policy, as Dr. Mm -hmm. Hankin sort of alluded to, what are the next steps? Yeah. yeah. And I think another, I think it's incredibly important that we all be boosted and particularly so uh, women of childbearing age, but also we need to be able to do things to keep our hospitals open, to keep our schools open, and let's face it, this population is also a large part of people who are doing just that. So I think that immunizing young families, children, and, uh, and people of childbearing age, it's all incredibly important. Um, Dr. Hankins has a hand up. I just wanted to say that every province is different. We're seeing different guidelines by age, by whether you're immunosuppressed, uh, by the interval even, whether you have to wait the full six months. I do know that Quebec offered already 10 days ago to put pregnant people higher on the list and they were able to access it before they dropped the age to 65. Ontario is 18 plus. So I think just get in there, make your, you make your appointment as soon as you can. Yeah, and it might be particularly different, um, more difficult today because this is the day it opened up to everyone, but hopefully over the next days and weeks, things will become um, easier to book, at least specifically in Ontario. Um, I'm just going back up to the questions just to see if there's any more. There was another one that, um, hold on, give me a second. Um, have antibodies in infants been measured and correlated with the antibodies in mother's milk? I think Dr. O'Connor, um, I think you were discussing this as part of your study. Do you want to rephrase that again or reemphasize that? Well, I mean, the best evidence I see of that right now, like the neutralization assays, that's a proxy for um, whether it would help the uh, infant, but it is a proxy. And there's um, you know, there's debate about what level of neutralization is sufficient. Is there, do you need so much and that's good enough? Or is it sort of a linear uh, effect? So, um, you know, you, you did see in the, the results that I presented, um, did, you did see uh, neutralization with a, a live virus, but then also with regard to that new data, actually seeing those antibodies still in stool um, and, and those were correlated with the amount in mother's milk. Thank you. Question came in, is there any rationale or recommendation to delay pregnancy at this time? Dr. Money, do you wanna answer that? You know, I think that's a really personal choice um, uh, depending on the individual circumstances. Um, if, you know, I think it's a scary time to become pregnant when uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're in the middle of a sort of unknown next phase with Omicron. Um, I, I think it, I wouldn't be saying don't get pregnant, but I think you would want to consider your circumstances and the world around you and your risks based on your work and other things. Um, whether you have other young children that are going to be exposed and bringing virus home, um, you know, so I think those are, uh, those are personal decisions. So I would understand um, if an individual chose to delay a pregnancy until we're through the worst of this pandemic. And the question sort of um, related to that is how do you think Omicron might impact um, your findings or recommendations? And I, I, I don't know if that's specifically to the findings, which study that question is referring to, but in general, I think anyone can answer this, given Omicron right now, 
anything about your findings or your predictions, you know, would that change at all or, or your recommendations based on your findings during Omicron over the next few weeks and months? I mean, yeah, I can start. I, I, others should jump in. You know, I think we, we need to wait and look at the data for sure. Um, but I think it, it, it amplifies our desire for pregnant women not to become infected, even if, even if it might be a milder disease, uh, and to be maximally vaccinated and protected, what, you know, based on their opportunity to do so, um, and to be particularly careful about all the usual public health recommendations that everybody's been tired of, but, but needing to adhere to. So um, I, I don't think, I think recommendations won't differ drastically, they may just you know, we may, we may uh, perhaps go to prioritization um, in other provinces for pregnant persons to be vaccinated. But, um, but I, I think for in terms of outcomes, that's why these studies are really important to do, because we need to know those answers as time goes by. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, question that came in, uh, is it recommended to be vaccinated between 26 and 32 weeks since there's better transfer of antibodies? I may get Dr. Money to jump in after I make an initial comment. I, I think I had made that comment earlier that was specifically about uh, pertussis. So, you know, there's a lot of research that had shown that the uh, transfer of maternal antibodies was kind of optimized in that time window. We don't really, I don't think know um, if there's a difference in that optimal time uh, window for transfer of maternal antibodies to the babies for COVID-19. But the main rationale for becoming vaccinated in pregnancy is actually to protect the pregnant, uh, pregnant individuals. Um, obviously, it's icing on the cake that uh, any maternal antibody would also, you know, presumably protect the newborns as well from from COVID infection. But I think the the bigger rationale, and it's similar with influenza, and certainly in an influenza pandemic, where um, the, the the whole point is really to protect the pregnant people, and they can become infected and ill at any point in pregnancy. Thank you. Yeah, if I can just add a point of emphasis to what's been said there, we do not want uh, individuals to delay vaccination to that time point. Um, we want them to get optimally vaccinated with the dose schedule and booster if possible, so that they're protected, um, in fact, even preconception and, and keep that high level of antibodies. So, uh, so it would not be desirable to deliberately delay because of the intent to protect the mom, the, the pregnant individual, uh, and, and as, as just to repeat what was just said, it, it's the bonus that we transfer antibodies to the infant. Yeah, I think that's a very important message. Um, a follow up to that question is what is the best dosage? Maybe they're referring to Moderna given that there's two doses between the 50 microgram and the 100 and the best delay for pregnant women. I, I, I think perhaps if I'm interpreting perhaps that, you know, if you're three months out from your second dose versus six months out, this is my interpretation of this question. Um, any thoughts about that? Oh dear, um, here I go again. <laughs> um, I can I can help you with the the milk part. It did sure, see, why did you where the IGA, you know, we did see if we're just looking at IGA, it looked like um, sort of opposite to at least my reading of the literature is um, the the you know initially prescribed dose between the two um, the timing was better. So a longer period of time was not necessarily helpful in terms of maximizing the peak of the second dose. And then in terms of Moderna being half a dose for the booster or the full dose, any recommendations for that in the pregnant population or lactating population? We would be going with the recommendation for the age group. Um, because we don't want to, uh, you know, the, the bigger dose is really for immunocompromised elderly. Um, and so if you're a young, you're going to be younger uh, as a pregnant person. And so we would want you to get that appropriate dose for your age group, um, because you do make good antibodies. Pregnant the individuals make good antibodies. It, that's not the problem. Um, and I, I, I think the problem with the interval um, is that it's variable from province to province. So I think you'll have to go with the recommended interval and the rationale behind that in your province. Um, and there's 
you know, there's, uh, there is generally uh, support for uh, a longer than the, than the vaccine company's recommended interval, but exactly the, that we're, pr we're probably the VC is probably the one with the, the longest interval um, uh, and data to support that. Do we have time for a few more questions? <laughs> There's more that are coming in. Um, we might have, do we have time for one more? And this is about he pregnant healthcare workers. Um, should pregnant healthcare workers um, have the risk of catching the virus? If the risk of catching the virus is real, continue to work or should they be withdrawn? Yeah. <sighs> I think that's again a, an individual scenario situation because healthcare worker is a very, very big category and each individual pregnancy is, is different and the person's other risks of uh, getting ill are different. So uh, there is not, to my understanding, been a general um, uh, approach to having pregnant healthcare workers off work, um, but there may be individual specific circumstances where that's appropriate. Um, so I, I, that's not a, that's more of a occupational health kind of scenario, but I think the big issue is, is using really careful um, uh, infection prevention and control measures as for any workers and maybe just a little bit more fastidious for a pregnant uh, worker to ensure that they're vaccinated and they're not being inappropriately exposed to um, infectious circumstances. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Money, and thank you, everyone. Um, I think given the time, we're going to have to wrap up. But on a personal level, I've really enjoyed hearing from all of you today. Um, unfortunately, I, I need to use the time remaining on a few very brief announcements. So on behalf of CITF and Can COVID, I'd like to thank today's speakers and attendees for sharing your time with us and for contributing to this really important discussion. We know how busy you all are, and so we appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. So this event series will resume in January where the featured topic will be about boosters and waning immunity. So stay tuned for that. And if you're interested in seeing um, any of the publications referenced in today's event, you can find them listed on CITF's website and at the end of this event's recording. And finally, we'd really like to wish all of you a happy and safe holiday. Thanks again for joining us and bye for now. We would like to thank today's speakers and attendees for their time, as well as the members of our networks for their continued support and participation in Canada's pandemic response. If you are interested in attending our monthly research results and implications events, please visit either website for more information.